It has one of the toughest and longest lockdowns in the world. But the ultra-strict quarantine measures have left more than five million Filipinos hungry. Sobrang sakit po. Siyempre po, ah, parang nakakaan, nakakayari mo, nagpukulit ng gulay. Siyempre, mas unahin mo makakain ka kaysa may iaya ka pa. More than 10 million people have lost their jobs and their livelihoods destroyed. Ako din mismo kahit nagtatanong ako, limang buwan na, bakit wala pa rin, wala pa rin ba, ano, kumbaga, ano tawag doon? Uh, wala pa rin linaw, linaw na sagot dyan sa, ano eh, sa epidemiyang yan. Why did the pandemic hit the poorest of the poor so hard? When a crisis like this hits an, an equal society like the Philippines, it's like amplifying the inequality and the social divide. So the poor are bearing the brunt of an equal distribution of uh, the impacts of this crisis. As the Philippine economy is crashing into its worst recession in decades, how can the country's poor pull themselves out of the crushing poverty? Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, a business hub plagued by economic disparity. As the city progresses, 35% of its population, or more than 4 million, still reside in slums. They are laborers who have to contend with meager incomes of less than $2 a day. Napakahalaga na makilala natin sino ba talaga nagpapatakbo nito at bakit yung bumubuo at nagpapatakbo ng lungsod, nananatili sila sa kahirapan. No? Hindi nila natatamasa yung, uh, yung yaman na, uh, na pinapakita no? o yun yung pinoproject ng lungsod. And now Manila has become the new epicenter for the coronavirus outbreak in Southeast Asia with slums considered as viral hotbeds for the transmission of the disease. Space is a luxury for the rich. Um, so the poor, they live in small homes, in crowded, congested communities. The vulnerability, of course, with any sort of infectious disease is the enclosed space, the close interaction, the amount of people you're interacting with. Uh, the poor really have it worse in in, in the normal time, they also have it worse, I think, in times of crisis right now. But the country's urban poor is facing a fear far more frightening than COVID. The fear of starvation. Hindi kami natakot mamatay sa COVID. Takot kami na mamatay sa COVID. As work and incomes dry up, Starvation is forcing the urban poor to cope in unthinkable ways. Midnight at one of Manila's biggest slums. 64-year-old Bernadette Sablazar and her neighbor Elena Perena, together with Elena's 16-year-old daughter, Leia, breach quarantine restrictions in search of food. As an elderly, Bernadette is required to stay at home. And like her, teenage Leia is also not allowed to be outside of her residence. Yet in spite of all the restrictions, they're venturing out during curfew hours and risk being caught. But they're too hungry to care for rules. I don't Pag, pag kakain, pagigising po ako, wala pong pagkain. Kapag wala ka pong maka, 
pagkain, hindi ka po pa nakakakain. Tatama rin ka kumilos, kumbaga nung papay ka na lang, parang nanginginig ka na lang sa butom nung hindi ka na magsasalita. Tapos pag nagugutom po ako, wala, na, wala pong nagbibigay sa akin kasi po walang pera. Hungry and desperate, they're braving their way to Divisoria, Manila's largest public market. To scavenge for vegetable scrap, or collect leftover goods freely handed out by generous sellers. Sa panahon ngayon na ah, ang hirap at parang takot pa kami ng mabas dahil sa ah, uhulihin ka ng police ko. Pag sinita ako ng police ang kapupunta. Sabi ko mamumulot ako ng gulay dahil yun lang yung tanging makakatu makaka kahit paano makatulong sa pamilya ko na madagdag graos gutom. The lockdown has crippled Elena and Bernadette's ability to work and earn an income. Bernadette is an egg seller who used to earn 15 US dollars a day. Elena is a freelance massage therapist who could earn up to 30 US dollars on good days. She was doing well enough to even put up a small store to help with the family's daily spend. But everything just fell apart during the first week of the lockdown. Elena's family was forced to consume every food stock they had in their small store. Kapag hindi sila nagtrabaho, wala sila makakain. Yung urban poor, uh, halos wala nga yung konsepto ng weekend kasi kahit weekend, kailangan nilang dumiskarte, kailangan nilang rumakit. No? At uh, kahit nga wala silang trabaho, hahanap yan ng paraan para makadiskarte ng pera sa paglalaba, sa informal work, may iba't ibang informal work, pedicab, etc. Hindi kami sanay na magpalimo sa ating pamahalaan. Sanay kami maghanap buhay. Pero sa panahon ngayon, nawala na sa amin yun. Hindi kami makapaghanap buhay. The crisis has damaged, significantly damaged, the asset base of urban poor. Street vendors couldn't sell on the streets. Uh, jeepney drivers, pedicab drivers, tricycle drivers couldn't operate, couldn't go out and uh, pick up passengers. So it would be very difficult for them to recover economically from this crisis. Like Bernadette and Elena, many Filipinos experienced hunger amid the lockdown. In fact, the Philippines' hunger incidence rate is at its highest in six years, according to the Social Weather Station, a non-profit research institution. The poll reveals that 20.9% or 5.2 million Filipino families have experienced involuntary hunger at least one in the past three months of the quarantine period. <laughs> Ah, parang nakakaano, nakakayari yun, yung napupulit ng gulay. Siyempre, mas una ay mong makakain ka kaysa may yaya ka pa. After four hours, Elena, Bernadette, and Leia have collected more than enough to tide them through the next two days and are planning on giving their extras around their neighborhood. Doon sa ibang lugar, hindi uh, ramdam, ramdaman mo rin talaga kasi dumadaing din sila sa amin, humihingi din sila ng, ng kahit papano, humihingi sila sa amin, may mga dumadating kaming ayuda, kahit papano. Ramdam namin, eh, dati naman hindi nila ginagawa yun namang hingi sa uh, amin, pero sa ngayon talaga, uh, nangihingi sila. The Philippine government has come in with aid to help mitigate the problem of hunger among the people. A week after announcing its quarantine measures, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte signed into law a package of emergency cash subsidy to 18 million low-income families. Beneficiaries will receive at least 100 US dollars to a maximum of 165 US dollars each month for two months. City governments and village leaders were given a month to distribute the aid, and aid had to reach swiftly. 
But many, like Elena, didn't receive her subsidy right away, even after waiting for more than a month. Elena borrowed just enough money to purchase rice. Bawat sign ko ay isang kilo. Noon, pwede pa ako mag-sign na umaga. Ay ngayon dahil crisis na, dalawang bisis na lang ako nagsasign. Ano na lang sa umaga, kape na lang muna. Diretso na lang tanghali yan. So, malaking deprensya. If not for these loans, as well as Elena's risky venture to the market earlier today, her family could have fallen very ill, or worse, die of starvation. Nakakasana yung gotom sa toyo at saka kanin, asin or ano man, ayun, yun yun, basta maano lang yung gotom. Iiyakan at iiyakan ka talaga kapag gotom. Alam mo mga bata, minsan napapalo mo na lang kapag wala ka talaga, kaya pipilitin ka kung wala. Minsan kapag ano, kakain, kakain kami ng asin, hindi, nung titignan niya na lang kami, yung kakain kami, yung asin na lang ulam namin, Ay po, asin lang yung ulam namin. Ba, baka inisip ni mama na ano, di niya kaya bigay lahat ng ano. Kung yung anong gusto namin ulam, kung anong gusto namin, ayun lang nabibigay niya kasi po lockdown. Pero kahit asin lang, okay lang sa amin. Is nakakakain kami. The poor are battling hunger and a crippling lockdown. Is the government doing enough to alleviate their pain? Will help come in time before the situation spirals out of control? Soon after announcing a nationwide lockdown, President Rodrigo Duterte signed into law the Social Amelioration Program, or SAP. Under the SAP, the government provides 18 million low-income families with a much-needed emergency cash subsidy. Each beneficiary will receive at least 100 US dollars each month for two months. City governments and village leaders were given a month to distribute the aid. The distribution had to be swift, so that aid gets to the more vulnerable segments of the population. As an urban poor, Elena Perena qualifies as a beneficiary for the social amelioration program. She was expecting to receive the promised first month cash subsidy immediately but help didn't come along until two months after. Aid was not only slow, but it was also very little. Elena received only 138 US dollars on her first month of subsidy, equivalent to about four days of her usual daily income. Siguro may isang linggo lang sa akin yun, kasi binawas at ilang bayad na, o, taas panggasta. Naglit lang, di ba? Eh kung noon yun, medyo masapat pa yung kita, wala pa yung isang linggo, nubos na. The emergency cash subsidy is only about a quarter of what a family of five actually needs in a month to get by based on current estimates by economists and urban poor advocates. Well, the thing is, the subsidy was not meant to be like a cure-all. It was just meant to be a, a partial subsidy. So, and we have to recognize also that government has its own uh, constraints 
they they don't have infinite money. Elena's problem is even more dire. That's because she has 10 children and 13 grandchildren living under the same roof. Except for one, all of them don't earn an income after their employers had temporarily ceased their businesses. The government claims it has nothing left to extend its subsidies. But the harsher reality is Elena's family are much better off than most. Other families had waited for far much longer to receive their first month emergency cash subsidies. Three months into the lockdown, five million families are still wondering if their aid is ever going to come. The majority waited so long, and also the tranche they got was next to nothing. It was equivalent to about nine pesos per person per day over the last five months. You can't do anything with that. A huge cause of delay, a random distribution of aid. We also, we've heard a lot about irregularities in the distribution. Some local officials were prioritizing their own relatives, their own probably friends. They would prioritize their friends because we have a very weak democratic system that hardly works in some areas. Mm -hmm. So, and that of course affects the poor who are supposedly benefiting fairly from the distribution, but uh, some of them were not able to receive this assistance because they were not part of that patron client system in their area. Under the law, an irregularity like this is a criminal offense. On the second month of the lockdown, the national government received more than 2,000 complaints against village council officials for the delay in the distribution of aid. Currently, the Philippine Prosecutor's Office have charged 134 officials with various graft-related cases. 50 officers are now suspended from office. But the crux of the matter is, local governments are also facing systemic problems. The Philippines has barely begun transitioning to a national ID system, though a newly created law mandates it. That's why city governments had to rely on an outdated list of their constituents based on a national census that was held five years ago. As a result, many Filipinos have been excluded. During the pandemic, even if we wanted to have universal cash transfers, we couldn't because there was no mechanism. There was no way for us to locate any, everybody. Now, nearly six months after announcing provisions for emergency cash subsidies, the government has given the second month subsidy to almost 95% of beneficiaries. The original sin with the social mediation program is that the government was so stingy about it. Parang napilitan lang sila. Um, you did not get a sense that they wanted to help as many people as quickly as possible. Elena is unsure if her second month subsidy is coming. In the meantime, Elena's debts are piling up. She currently owes about 100 US dollars from friends. On top of utility bills, she has to pay. Sa loob ng apat na buwan, nagiging 16,000 yung bill ko. O paano ko pa mababayaran yan? Hindi pa puputol ko na lang yan. Elena's family has also become too poor to protect themselves against COVID-19. Minsan po kapag ganun, di ba kunyari, isa lang yung maskote sa lalabahan ko. Tapos pag sinampay ko po, gagamitin po ng isa kong kapatid. Tapos mawawalan po ako ng mask. Minsan po kapag lalabas po ako, parang pinakabag po ako kasi puso yung virus. The Philippines is known to have one of the most restrictive lockdowns in the world. A special pass was needed to move around to buy essential goods. Those who violate the curfew and social distancing measures or fail to wear a mask will be punished. They range from fines to detention. Mass gatherings like protests are banned. 
But on the third week of the lockdown, a hundred Filipinos gathered at EDSA, a main thoroughfare where historic protests happen. 64-year-old Cesar Galamoza was one of them. May nagsabi na ano, yung mga parang haka-haka ba? I mean, story na, oh, bukas, sumama ka. Bakit ka ako? Sabi ko gano'n. Para makaano tayo ng kalating kaban. May ano na mamimigay daw bukas. As an elderly, he's not allowed outside of his residence. But Caesar is desperate. He lives from paycheck to paycheck after he lost his blue-collar job. Minsan, lugaw-lugaw lang mo naman para medyo matipid-tipid eh. Napaantay pa tayo. At least, mahalagyan lang ng sikmura na makalam na. Yung mga bata, na ano namin na mga kain sila ng maayos. O yung una pa, naggagatas pa kasi. Penniless and famished, Caesar decided to join his neighbors at Edsa. He arrived at nine in the morning. There was no relief distribution in sight. Marami na pong mga tao nag-aabang. Iba, hindi na nga tinupad yung ano, wala na sa isip yung social distance. Yung iba, walang mga mas. Yung iba, mayroon. Ako, may mas din po ako noon. Yung uh, panahon na yun, oras na yun. Later, a team of police arrived to disperse the crowd. Driven into a corner, time and options are running out for the urban poor. Will the government be able to deliver a solution? Or will anger spill out into the streets? Three weeks into the Philippine lockdown, a commotion over food aid erupted at EDSA, one of Manila's main thoroughfares. A day before the incident, rumors spread across the slum village of San Roque that a sack of rice would be given out as aid at EDSA. Although mass gatherings are banned, about 300 people turned up the following day. Soon, the police arrived and advised them to disperse. But driven by desperation, 64-year-old Cesar Villamosa stayed on. Pero ako, nagtaga pa rin ako. Kasi sabi nung ano, huwag okay, mo, mo na kayo umuwi. Dahil may darating nga daw na truck na may karga ng mga yung pamimigay na tulong. Kalating sako o yung mga, mga goods, mga relief, ganyan. Di ako naniwala naman ko, di antay-antay ako. The pandemic, it really put a strain on the poor. They are already the most vulnerable. They, like, they, they put a strain on the poor because absolutely, the poor would not want to get sick. As much as possible, they don't want to, to be sick because they know it's going to cost money. They know it's going to stop them from working. The poor do not want to get sick, but they will risk life and limb if they're not going to be able to feed themselves. So, yung ganitong klaseng kahit chismis lang, kahit hindi confirm, talagang dadagsain siya ng mga tao kasi gutom na sila eh. So, pagdating doon at wala, wala talaga nadatnan, naghintay sila, at yung iba, nagkaroon na ng panawagan. No? So, yung iba, kumuha na rin talaga ng, ano, ng uh, mga papel, no? kartolina nga yata, no? sinulat nila na gutom na kami, ganyan, ibigay na ninyo yung ayuda, etc. No? Tapos doon na nagsimula itong uh, hulihan na ginawa ng PNP. Dumating na yung malaking truck na may mga, ano, ng mga polis, yung nanguhuli sa mga rally, ganyan. Ay, kala nila rally yung pinunta namin, hindi naman eh. Pagkain yung hinihingi namin, hindi rally. Sabi kong ganun. Hala, nandiyan na. No, inahabol na kami. Ay, ako patakbo na sana ako, malapit na ako doon sa yung skinita na daanan namin pa na. That's how Caesar ended up in detention for five days. Together with 20 others, they were charged with five cases allegedly in violation of quarantine rules and health emergencies. 
these offences could have put them in detention for six months. In the Philippines, violations are quite commonplace. Since the lockdown was implemented in mid-March, more than 300,000 quarantine violators were apprehended by authorities. Violators were warned, fined, detained or charged. Most of these violators come from impoverished families. Pag kayo ang na-detain, bahala kayo sa pagkain ninyo. The night of the commotion, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte addressed the country about the incident. He suspected that leftist insurgents were behind it and promised to act tough against the rumor mongers. Huwag ninyo akong takote ng gulo-gulo kasi kung gusto talaga ninyo ng gulo, gogulohin natin ang baya natin. Total, wala pa naman pagkain. Kung gusto ninyo ng barilan, di sige. But politics are pointless to those barely surviving. Pero sabihin nyo na lang kung ako man nasa posisyon nyo, kami na, kayo kami sa posisyon namin, ano mang gagawin nyo? Mahirap na palang gawin yung ganun. Babaliin mo yung yung inuutos ng gobyerno. Huwag mo sawayin. E paano naman kami? Mamamatay kami sa gotom? Ganyan? There is no understanding. There is no social consideration. There is no value being given to the life that is supposed to be saved. That is the most difficult part for me to understand. You enforce a quarantine because you want to save lives. You want to save lives by spreading, by, by, by stopping the spread of disease. And yet here we are. Here is the government having very little consideration for that life. It, it just goes against the grain, the very grain of our humanity. Caesar and the other 20 detainees are now out on bail, paid for by two influential celebrities. It cost more than 6,400 US dollars to release them, an amount they could not have raised by themselves. Fortunately, they also received free legal assistance. If not for these, Caesar and his family would have no choice but to accept the punishment. But Caesar continues to confront his worsening poverty day by day. Nearly six months into the lockdown, he and his daughter are still waiting for a job. He also faces a pile of debts and the prospect of eviction from his rented home, even as they're trying to cope with the problem of starvation. Buti pa yun, wala man lang ID. Kasi ang gusto nga namin, uwi na lang kami ng probinsya pagkatapos itong kaso namin eh. Kahit, kahit pa paano doon, wala kang, walang maniningil sa'yo ng paupan ng bahay. At least tubig, yung kuryente, kahit na walang kuryente doon, ano na lang, yung gasira na lang, okay na yun. Ironically, many urban poor come to Manila in search of a better life, away from rural poverty. But even in the city, life has been a constant struggle. COVID-19 has threatened to displace nearly 11 million workers from the informal sectors and erase years of progress on poverty alleviation. The truth is, there are not enough policies and mechanisms to help pull the poor out of their poverty trap. Nasa cycle sila ng kahirapan kasi structurally, systemically, napapanatili silang ganun. So lahat ng ito, no, systemically, hindi talaga sila makakaangat sa buhay nila no, kahit pa magsikap ka na magsikap ng magsikap. No, kasi uh, wala, wala silang paraan para... Uh, para magkaroon ng advantage no, pagdating sa buhay. But also I think because people are seeing how unequal the Philippines is and how problematic our politics is, I think we are in the middle of a moment. People are actually asking, is this the government we deserve? Are these economic policies we need? Why are people so bad off? The Philippines has been fighting chronic poverty since the late 1960s. For decades, the nation had always been dubbed as the sick man of Asia. But a series of economic reforms in early 2000 paved the way for growth. 
from opening country to country international trade, foreign direct investments like business process outsourcing, as well as hospitality and tourism. In 2013, the Philippine economy finally gained strength. The World Bank described the Philippines as Asia's rising tiger. With its GDP rising steadily, the Philippines was no longer the sick man of Asia, but a breakout nation with one of the most promising economies in the world. Philippine poverty rates were finally going down, but it was just numbers. These income indicators actually, one, don't fail to capture so many other dimensions of poverty, but secondly, and I think it's the worst thing for us, it's actually used to hide high levels of poverty. We have you know, the richest 50 Filipinos having a combined wealth of 4.1 trillion pesos, which is equivalent to the combined wealth of the poorest 60 to 70 million Filipinos. That doesn't make sense. A clear evidence of uneven, exclusionary growth is right in the slums. The urban poor have been struggling to own homes. In the last 10 years, Caesar's informal settlement has been defying eviction and demolition. About 6,000 families live on this government-owned property. But a part of this real estate has been sold to a private developer with no plan of resettling its slum dwellers. The first thing we have been fighting for the urban poor is the family. Um, hindi ka rin naman kasi makakagalaw sa loob ng uh, sa loob ng lungsod kung wala kang titirhan no at nakita natin na parang uh, napakarami din talaga ng informal settler families dito sa loob ng uh, ng lungsod no at bakit ganun kasi walang pinoprovide na pabahay sa kanila yung uh, yung pamahalaan no at wala din naman silang capacity uh, para bumili ng sariling bahay o mangupahan doon sa mga area na napakataas ng upa. So while GDPs have been rising, job opportunities and better labor conditions among the urban poor are barely improving. Many of the urban poor remain as workers in the informal economy, as drivers of jeepneys and rickshaws, street peddlers, owners of small convenience stores, or manual laborers in the construction industry. Statisticians and economists estimate that at least 62% of Filipinos are working in the informal economy. That's about 30 million informal workers suffering through decades of income inequality. You also have a lot of workers who don't have legal protection of the law but they are still there, they, you know, the street vendors, the tricycle drivers, the barkers of jeepneys. They are workers, they are contributing to the economy, but they are not part of the mantle of legal environment. It's no wonder the urban poor like Elena, Bernadette and Caesar are the most vulnerable during the pandemic. The urban poor like them already had it worst before COVID-19 as mere daily wage earners without safety nets and social protection. I'm still calling this pandemic as, in a way, a, slow, as a, a form of slow-moving disaster. Why? Because disasters or crises don't exist in a vacuum. In the case of the Philippines, we have very weak democratic institutions. And for us to be able to manage this well, to begin with, this has reached this level, this unprecedented level, because I think it was poorly managed from the start. The Philippine government wants to recover from the pandemic by providing corporate tax breaks and loans to SMEs. But so far, they've been silent on how to help the urban poor in the informal sector. Or perhaps there is really none at all. Now the urban poor are resorting to self-help, while a new sector is plunging into poverty. But how much can they do to solve their financial and health woes?
In Manila, Philippines, the urban poor are left on their own to survive through the pandemic. In San Roque, an informal settlement with roughly 30,000 residents, many have been jobless throughout the six-month-long quarantine. In place of their jobs, the city government helped to distribute rice to local residents. Kulang. Kulang na kulang yung bigay nila. Kahit sabihin nagbibigay sila ng ano, wala. Walang ano. Kahit nga nung panahon ng lockdown, dalang, bali tatlong beses lang kami nakatanggap ng taglilimang kilong bigas dito eh. To solve hunger in their community, Fair Sidco decided to help in a community kitchen. The non-profit organizations helped to raise funds to kickstart this initiative. They established 28 community kitchens throughout San Roque, providing breakfast to 3,000 residents. Kasi meron kang pandemya, di ba? At kailangan maging malusog yung mga tao. Hindi sila magiging malusog kung puro dela tayong papakain mo sa kanila. Aside from this kitchen, the non-profit organizations helped pull together community health volunteers, like Gelin Rossillo. As most of them are undereducated, volunteer doctors taught them about how to respond to the threat of COVID-19 infections and what they can do to avoid falling ill. But they have a more important task. Volunteers like Gelin look out for COVID-19 symptoms around the neighborhood and deliver food to those under quarantine. In closed and congested places where COVID virus would most likely thrive, mass testing at San Roque hasn't even begun. The residents also claim that government healthcare workers avoided their slum community. They've been told that government frontliners lack personal protective equipment, or PPE, too. That's why most residents feared for their lives. Noon kasagsagan talaga ng COVID na yun, takot yung mga tao lumabas. O kahit na may mga relief dyan na nagka-dikit-dikit sila, takot yung mga tao mahawaan talaga eh. So, from the point of view of individual vulnerability, the poor is already vulnerable. Their, 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 their immune system is low, they're not, they're not eating the food that they need to survive, and they don't have the, the rest. Mandatory precautionary measures like safe distancing, hand washing, hand sanitation, and mask wearing are luxuries for slum dwellers. 50, 60, 75, ganun ang mahal. Wala, hindi, hindi yan afford ng mga maralita eh. Kumbaga, mag-issue sila sa mga lahat ng mga marita, lahat ng mga squad, bigyan nila ng pang isang buwan o pang isang taon yan kung kailan man gagamitin, kung hanggang kailan ang pandemyang ito, kung i-required to ang, ang disposable mask na to, ibigay nila. Pag isang taon, pag dalawa, bigay nila ng libre. Hindi yung pahirapan kami na bibili-bili kami. So, Gelin relied on private donations to assist her community. But nearly six months into quarantine, help has stopped coming. Ngayon, pag nangingi sila, tapos sabihin namin na wala, na parang, ang ano ba, parang kumikirot sa dibdib mo. Kasi dati nagawa namin, bakit ngayon hindi na? Minsan parang, hindi na lang ako pumupunta. <laughs> Kapupunta kasi parang pag may nagsabi sa'yo, wala kang maibigay, parang sakit sa loob. Gusto mo sanang gawin, pero walang wala ka rin eh. Hindi ba? Back in the community kitchens, funds are also running out. No new pledges have come in. Shalita's community kitchen used to feed 75 people five times a week. Now, they are down to 35, twice a week. Kasi ang ano namin, bali tinapos na lang namin yung bigas na sa center po. Yun, bali nag-ano naman kami ng ano yung tawag yan, yung merienda, sopas. This week's feeding will actually be the last. Hungry as she may be, Shalita had not been eating from meals they'd prepared. That's because she feels others need the food more than her. Kagaya yung ano, may na ano sa akin, ano, nanay iing. Pahingi naman ako dyan ng ano, pambili lang ng almusal. 
bibigyan ko din siya kasi ano kung sempre pangkain nga niya. But community volunteers like Faye is not giving up. She decided to grow vegetables on her backyard to be a food source whenever someone asks for help. So at the end of the day, if this community kitchens uh, dry up and we stop providing food, the government has to come in. Uh, at the end of the day, it's their responsibility to provide relief and to help the struggling urban poor in their own vicinity, in their own city. So if the government is not part of that, it's like you are exonerating the state from its responsibility to provide the needed assistance, especially of the urban poor. Ako din mismo kahit nagtatanong ako, ah, limang buwan na, bakit wala pa rin, wala pa rin ba, ano, kumbaga, ano tawag doon, uh, wala pa rin linaw, linaw na sagot dyan sa, ano eh, sa epidemiyang yan. Unlike Shalita, there's only so much that Gelin can do to protect herself. If she gets infected with COVID-19, she will not receive any free treatment. The national government extends help to those who contribute to a state health insurance. But Gelin is too poor to make the voluntary contributions. Si natatakot din ako kasi hindi ko alam yan kung saan kumakapit yung virus eh baka mamaya madala ko sa kanila. Tapos magkaroon siya ako pala yung pare ako yung nagbigay ng sakit sa mga anak ko. Kaya takot pero kinakaya, pinilit ko yan kinakaya. As many of the urban poor struggle on their own through the community quarantine, another sector of society is increasingly desperate. Jeepney drivers are resorting to begging or protesting to go back to work. Jeepneys are the most popular transportation in the Philippines. It's known for its crowded seating, so the government allows less than 5% of jeepneys to ply through the roads as a containment measure. Well, if we're looking at their numbers, there's more than, I think, 170,000 jeepney units nationwide. So you're talking about 170,000 families nationwide relying on the jeepney industry. So you multiply that by, what, five or six members. So we're talking about close to one million people relying on the jeepney industry alone. And uh, if we're not serious with listening to their demand or at least heeding their appeal, then it's like, you're basically ignoring one section of your population. Now, in just six months, jeepney drivers have fallen into poverty. Chito Bustamante had been driving a jeep for more than a decade to save up for his dream home. I was hoping to finish my job, I was hoping to finish my job, I was hoping to finish my job. Kaya kumuha ako kulog boundary na jeep. Tapos, sabi nila, di na makabiyay yung jeep. Eh, paano na nga ako? Wala pa akong sariling bahay. Yung ngayon na ko eh. Now, he is not only out of work. Chito has also no house to live in. Eh, baka may, mga ano kami, mga mga kapsyon, tapos bilang kami palayasin. Tapos pilitin kami pabayarin na wala man biyay yung jeep. Meanwhile, Honorario Borromeo had to rely on loan sharks to help supplement his unstable income and send his seven children to school. Napakahirap po ng buhay ng maging jeepney driver. Andiyan na po yung maraming risk na kinakaharap namin. Pangkalusugan, yun po yung uh, hindi, hindi stable na income, uh, merong off, may on. So yun po yung mga ayaw ko nang maranasan ng mga anak ko na 19-year-old Trisha is Honorario's eldest daughter, who has a year left before finishing her engineering degree. All she wants is to graduate from a university, be gainfully employed, and help her father, Honorario, in sending her siblings to school. 
Kaya, habang ang kaya pa po ni Papa, nag-aaral po kami ng mabuti para hindi po masayang yung pagod ni Papa. Adding to their worries is a contentious government plan to phase out jeepneys. They require jeepney owners like Honorario and Chito to upgrade to environmentally friendly vehicles. But it's an investment they cannot afford. They're still paying loans for the current jeepneys they own. The government hasn't extended assistance to jeepney drivers like Chito and Honorario, except for emergency cash subsidies. It's also unclear if they will ever get back on the roads, even when COVID-19 is over. We know at the end of the day, jeepney drivers will be displaced. Um, we do agree there is a need to modernize jeepneys, but there's a way to modernize jeepneys without leaving the poor and vulnerable drivers behind. Again, it involves the government subsidizing the transition. And that's the basic demand of GP drivers. Amidst these uncertainties, Honorario's children suffer the most. Trisha's dreams are put on hold, as Honorario was forced by circumstances to drop his children out of school. <laughs> Unang una po ano, lahat naman po ng estudyante ng mga bata, natulad ko po. <clears throat> Pangarap po natin na makapag-aral po kahit po sana ngayon po sa pandemic. Gusto po natin mag-aral kaya lang po. Andun nga po tayo sa sitwasyon na hindi medyo hindi po natin kaya. Honorario's family now sells native delicacies to enable the family to eat three times a day. While Cheeto has to find other ways to put food on the table, the only recourse is to scavenge for junk. Minsan, tinitingnan nila ako. Pag nangalakal ako, minsan, iniwasan nila ako. Nakala sa unang totoo talaga na ano ako. Na talagang nandun ako nabuhay sa kalakal, di nalaman driver ako. Kasi madugas na ako eh. Iba na yung suot ko eh. Pag sinilas ko, wala na yung dito, wala na. Butas-butas, doon oh. While strangers fear him, Chito actually has fears too. He worries about getting infected from the junk he collects. Oh, natakot ako din doon. Kasi yun nga sa sakit ng COVID, hindi ko alam kung saan kalaban natin ito. Ay ko, buti sa kung nakikita natin sa isip ko. Hindi natin nakikita, mahirap. For this morning, he traded the stash he's collected for one US dollar and 50 cents. It's enough to buy him a kilo of rice. Wala na rin pag-asa kung makabili ng bahay. Isa pa yung nakapalang wala na pag-asa talaga. Isa naiyak ako dyan kung lang mag-isa. Isa naisipan ko nga may bigya ko. Yun ang kaya. The government isn't doing enough. That's why they're so dismissive. Because they know the Filipino poor have suffered so much through all the years. They will survive. It's not a question of them recovering. Even if pushed to the ground, they will try their best to make do with what they have. Poverty is a vicious cycle, a self-perpetuating condition that can't simply be broken without external help. Caught in a daily struggle for survival, before the pandemic, that challenge was almost insurmountable. But a crippling lockdown brought on by COVID-19 has turned that challenge into a huge battle against hunger and hopelessness. How long can the poor hold on to hope before starvation takes over? How long more shall they wait before their cries for help give way into silence?